It's now my pleasure to introduce the Honorable Frank Lobiondo, Chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. On behalf of the Airline Pilots Association, we appreciate Representative Lobiondo's leadership of this important meeting, which has jurisdiction over all aspects of civil aviation, including safety, infrastructure, labor, commerce, and international issues. As chairman, Representative Lobiondo has shown a keen interest in U.S. aviation issues, such as NextGen, and since 1995, he has served as constituents from New Jersey's 2nd Congressional District, which is home to the FAA's William J. Hughes Technical Center. On a personal note, I've been on panels with the congressman uh, recently, and as some of you might have known, I had, uh, occur I had endured an injury uh, playing basketball. And in a conversation with the congressman, he related to me that he still plays basketball, and I took two things out of that conversation, which I think are very important uh, to share with you. First, uh, I need to have the will and determination to come back and finish, finish the game with my two sons, although I was down uh, 5 to 9 to 11. And with his assurance, I am confident I'll come back. But the second thing was a little more complicated when I was asking him, where is he playing basketball uh, in the area? And he mentioned several places, but he gave me a caution. He said, and I did go down to a pickup game down at 8th and I and played with the Marines. They were a little rough. Now, and I wouldn't advise you to do that. Now, knowing a thing or two about Marines, I was a little shocked at that. So I thought I'd call up the Commandant of the Marine Corps, which lives down at 8th and I, and ask him, hey, what, what's up with that? And he said, hey, Lee, those weren't just Marines. Those were Jersey Marines that we happened to have uh, playing with the congressman. And that explained it all. Bottom line, don't play with Jersey Marines. So with that, a big champion to the Airline Pilots Association, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Frank Lombiondo. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you, Lee, very much. Um, I do still enjoy playing basketball, and in the uh, Saturday morning games back home, uh, there's a really great group of guys. But one of the guys I've been particularly friendly with for a lot of the years I've been playing is a pilot for Delta. So I get to hear from him sort of firsthand uh, on some of the issues, and uh, we have some good bannering back and forth. But I am absolutely thrilled to be here. It's an honor to be here. Uh, serving as chair of the Aviation Subcommittee has been a, a dream of mine for a long time. Uh, chair of some of these committees is very difficult to attain. Uh, but I am determined... Uh, was determined and am determined as coming in as chair of the committee uh, to, to try to do the very best job possible. My background prior to coming to Congress was the private sector. It was um, running and operating a family trucking business. So I am one of the, I may be the only member of Congress who has a CDL. Uh, I always joke we need a backup in this job. We never know when we're going to have a problem. But the private sector um, activities are something that I've always tried to hold near and dear. So what does that mean to you? What does it mean to aviation? What does it mean to pilots? So what it means to me is that uh, as chair of the committee that we should be listening to the stakeholders. Now, it's important to listen to the people from government and it's important to listen to some of these people who come up with good theories but I am not particularly interested in what's coming out of a think tank. I'm particularly interested in what works in the cockpit, what works in the tower, what works in the, uh, in the airports, what works for passengers, what moves passengers, what keeps passengers safe. And that's why you play such a key role. Uh, as you can well know and understand, in the aviation community, there are numerous stakeholders, but certainly none any more important than the pilots. Those of you who are responsible for the passengers day in and day out in the safest system in the world. So I'm appreciative of the opportunity to be here today. 
uh, but especially appreciatively of the opportunity to continue to interact, uh, sometimes on very short notice, of things that we should be doing and how we should be doing them. Uh, with that in mind, I want to take a moment and remember the, uh, the victims of the, of the Asiana crash and their families and the agony that people go through in situations like that. Uh, we have a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, the committee is not activated on this. I've talked to, uh, at the time, uh, shortly after the accident, to uh, Administrator Huerta. I've also talked to NTSB Chair Hirschman, and uh, we're going to stay as much abreast of this as we can. But as we move forward, we know there are a number of issues that we need to pay attention to. Uh, I am leaving here this morning, and we have an aviation subcommittee uh, hearing on NextGen. Uh, NextGen is a program that we all believe holds great promise, uh, but we also understand it's had many problems. Some have been self-inflicted wounds that we've had over the years with how Congress has uh, forced the FAA to operate. Uh, you know, how do you go along with 22 short-term extensions? and be able to develop any sense of certainty and stability with the stakeholders? The answer is you can't. Then you follow that with a two-week devastating shutdown that was never supposed to happen, uh, that certainly could have been avoided. That was maybe one of the most serious self-inflicted wounds. And we find ourselves in a scenario where uh, we were almost forcing NextGen to be delayed and delayed and delayed. So the, uh, as was mentioned, I represent the Tech Center, the premier facility in the nation for safety and security research and development, and they're doing all the validation for NextGen. So I'm spending a lot of time with our folks trying to understand what's happening in the real world, how we can make this work better, where the obstacles are. And in order to do that, we've been holding a series of stakeholder meetings to try to understand from pilots and controllers and the carriers of where the obstacles are with NextGen and how we move it forward. You know, the standard line of, uh, you know, we just have a problem and, you know, we're sucking it up and, you know, these are unavoidable delays, that works to a certain point. But at a certain point, we've got to be able to connect the dots and get things on the right track and be able to get them moving so we can all realize the, the hopes and the promises for the safety and efficiencies that NextGen can provide. But along with NextGen, the work that the Tech Center does, over the years has focused on how to make air travel safer. And because of past tragedies, uh, they've worked very hard and have a whole series of bullet points of the work that they've done for flame retardant materials and uh, how to protect passengers. And I think that what we saw with the recent crash in San Francisco and the fact that there was a minimal loss of life and so many people were able to get out was a result of a lot of the work that was done at the Tech Center. So they're going to continue to play a major role, and uh, I hope we can continue to give them the resources from Washington to make that job happen and happen the way it should be. Sequestration has been a problem. Uh, that's a word I don't think I knew what it meant prior to a year or so ago. Uh, it's turned out to be one of those things that was so egregious that it would never happen because everyone would seek to avoid it, and lo and behold, we find ourselves in the middle of it, and I'm sure you saw firsthand what the problems were. I don't normally fly much. I drive back and forth to my district. It just so happened that the, uh, the week that that hit, uh, I had a family funeral out west that I had to fly to. I had a couple of other occasions to fly, and I saw firsthand what the consequences are for sequestration. I'm also on the House Armed Services Committee and the House Intelligence Committee, and we're also seeing very direct negative results that have occurred because of this terrible problem that we have self-inflicted on ourselves. Now, we have a serious spending problem, and at a certain point, you can't spend money that you don't have. You can't borrow money that you don't have in revenue coming in, at least not for very long. Uh, but we have an opportunity in the next few months to maybe readdress this, and I hope that we can begin to focus on what these problems were, what they are, and how we can avoid them, especially for aviation. Now, as, as we do move forward, uh, I think we're also going to try to understand uh, the FAA authorization bill, uh, that which we achieved after that devastating shutdown and 22 extensions, and try to understand what's working and what isn't working. 
from an oversight and authorization position that the committee has. Understanding uh, the law that we put into place, what's good about it, what's not so good, what needs to be tweaked, so that we're not waiting till the last minute when the next bill comes due, so that we can start to do the preparation work for it now. And that preparation work for understanding the, the benefits of the bill and the problems of the bill, uh, the law that are in place, come from the stakeholders. It's not coming from the bureaucracy. It's coming from those of you who are working with it each and every day. So we're going to spend uh, quite a bit of time as we move forward with trying to make sure with oversight that we're doing the right thing and that we can bring this all together in a meaningful way so that it results in a product that you can live with, that you can work with, uh, that's good for the traveling public, that's good for the airline industry, and all the stakeholders involved. So. Uh, once again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. There are probably a couple more topics that we could have touched on, but um, we'll leave time now for questions if there are any. I thank you for the work that you do each and every day, keeping our passengers safe, uh, the safest in the world, and applaud you for the dedication and focus and energy you put into your job. So thank you very much. came in from one of the uh, webcast viewers. Uh, there's a concern that the mandate for unmanned aircraft systems or UAS may, integration may be too soon. Until UAS can and are required to operate to the same standard as commercial aircraft, should they be prohibited from operating in the airspace? And is the subcommittee watching this? Uh, that's one of the topics that uh, I thought we might get a question on. Is the subcommittee uh, is spending a lot of time with this? Uh, I am personally spending a lot of time with it. Um, as you are well aware that uh, the Department of Transportation and the FAA are working through the applications uh, that will result in six designated locations for UAS uh, integration across the country. Now we expect that those announcements will be made on those six sites. Uh, some of them will be collaboration sites where two or three states are getting together, and that that will be done by the end of the year. Now, this has been delayed for a while. It's not a news flash to anyone that something in Washington gets delayed, but it's a critical issue. We know that UAS is uh, flying under cir certain circumstances now, but safe integration into the Arab space is something that's key and essential. Uh, we expect that the Tech Center will do the validation for the six sites across the country. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty concerned because uh, as I've learned more about this, I understand that uh, most of the UASs that we're talking about are very, very small. Uh, and my, my concern is that we've got a 50-pound uh, a 50 50 brick that gets sucked into a jet engine uh, with not a good outcome any way you look at it. So how do we make sure that we're safely integrated and that's something we're trying to get our arms around. We don't have the answers to it yet. But we will spend an enormous amount of time on first the safety angle of this, and secondly, the private security angles of this, uh, personal liberties angles of this. Uh, there is potential for abuses. Part of the uh, delay in the rollout was building in as best we could a lot of those privacy protections uh, we're looking forward to enhancing that even farther, uh, but we do understand that uh, the UAS will have to be integrated, and we're going we're gonna to do our best to do that in the most meaningful and safe way possible. Thank you, sir. We have another one that came in. Uh, foreign ownership and control has been put on the table by the EU. Do you or the committee have a position or concerns about this? Uh, foreign ownership is a big concern. It first surfaced, uh, I guess, three or four years ago. 
Uh, I joined with then Chairman of the Full Committee, Jim Overstar, and uh, Chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee, Jerry Costello from Chicago, in very strong opposition to foreign ownership. Uh, I don't know that I am comfortable speaking for the Full Committee, but I'm very comfortable saying from my vantage point, uh, I am totally, completely, 100% against foreign ownership. I see no good of that that can come for our airline industry. Uh, we just had some recent discussions about the early stages of the negotiation of the treaty that the administration is in. And while it looks like the administration is in a good position with foreign ownership issues from my perspective and I think your perspective uh, to keep it from happening, uh, we all know crazy things happen at the end of a negotiation and what trade-offs are. So um, I, I am very strongly against this and intend to be uh, very vigilant. And if we have to activate the committee, I think this is one of the areas in the past where we strong, saw strong bipartisan opposition to foreign ownership. I believe that uh, we can and I would work very hard to generate that same strong bipartisan opposition to a very misguided idea that will lead to no good for us. Yes, sir. This is the part where Captain Lowe can help the staff get nervous because we'll ask a question. <coughs> well, I, my name is Dennis Landry, and I work in the Master MEL Subcommittee group uh, for the Airline Pilots Association. That has a uh, quarterly meeting cycle that the entire industry and the FAA sent broad participation to. I've been in this committee since the uh, mid-90s. It's an outgrowth of the debacle that Frank Lorenzo brought to this industry where um, their eastern airplanes were flying around with a lot of broken equipment. Since you're in the trucking industry, you know what effect broken equipment has. All right, as the program has matured, it has encountered a lot of difficulties because of the 22 extensions and then the ses uh, sequestration that uh, we've encountered. So as you look into the future, is there a way to ensure that the, uh, these groups, like the Master MEL group, uh, receive enough funding to continue to have all of the uh, necessary FAA people uh, participate with with the industry in, in the quarterly meetings. It's been a difficult thing to watch the FAA's people struggle to meet the commitments, and they do a fine job, but you know, as you said, eventually uh, you just can't ask people to keep sucking it up. So uh, as you look into the, the funding issues that go forward, uh, I would plead with you that uh, that committee and, and so many of the other industry organizations the FAA participates with get, get enough funding to do so and to plan their activities. Uh, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Well, that's, that's a very important point. And uh, when sequestration was originally, uh, I guess, conceived and put into place, the intention was that it would affect everything across the board equally without, uh, without thought of how critical in nature something was. And I think that's one of the problems that we've got to try to untangle before October 1st and round two hits. Uh, clearly, um, what's going on with aviation and particularly with the equipment issues and with the FAA is not the same as selling wheat to Bulgaria. Uh, there is a list of priorities that are important to the nation, and I think that for whatever reason, when sequestration was first put into place and this wasn't considered because nobody thought it would ever happen, uh, we've got to understand that this can't be allowed to move forward as it did in the past. Uh, these funding issues, these disruptions, uh, these equipment problems are something that I think we've got to find a way around. I've talked extensively to Michael Werta about uh, how we in the subcommittee can help work with him. Uh, uh, we need to get the administration on board and understanding that uh, if they feel that there is not uh, any wiggle room with how the law is written, uh, we will do as we had to do uh, with the last go-around of sequestration. I, I didn't like how they took the funding or where they took the funding from, 
but at least there was a recognition that we could not impact air traffic control the way we were doing. It just uh, that did not make any sense. So this will be a priority. It will be something we'll be spending time with, um, but it's a pretty sticky wicket, as you can imagine. Yes, hello, uh, Mike Moss, Airline Pilot uh, Association volunteer. Uh, I've heard recently of uh, scale back in the Office of Runway Safety at the FAA. And just wanted to ask, do you feel that there will be adequate coverage in the various FAA regions and terminal areas regarding uh, runway safety? Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, there's some speculation that uh, the, the reporting that we've recently seen is, is a result of, uh, of, of better reporting, so to speak, but also clearly there are more incidents. So how do we get to the bottom of this? Because safety has to be a top priority. Um, I don't think the committee, we at the committee have determined exactly how to proceed uh, because those reports are very recent. Uh, it is something that is on, on, on our agenda to try to spend focus and energy uh, because the last thing we need to do is not have a report of a near miss, but have a report of an accident that has much more serious consequences, obviously. And other than uh, sort of tapping wings, so to speak, without anybody getting hurt, uh, of course, the biggest fear is that it's a much more serious, uh, serious problem. And, and we're going to try our best from a committee standpoint to work with the FAA on that. Crystal with uh, Health Volunteer as well. Uh, in the Air Traffic Services Group, we've heard that sequestration shut down the FAA's uh, Air Traffic Academy. Is there any plans to reopen that? There's going to be a lot of controller retirements, and how are we going to keep controllers on the scope and those positions filled? Uh, I sure hope so. Um, I had my first formal meeting with Michael Whitaker uh, about a week ago, and that was uh, one of the topics that came up. Uh, that we want to understand what the plan is and how we can keep that uh, sort of the number of air traffic controllers necessary. I have to tell you I am not satisfied with what's been explained to me at this point of how we make up the shortfall. Uh, I have been assured that that's one of the topics that we'll get the details on soon. Uh, but soon is rather, that time is running out on soon and we're now up against it because this isn't something that uh, you can train somebody to do in a couple weeks or a month, as you well know. Um, I don't know what the uh, what the plans are from the FAA standpoint, but it's something we've been pressing them to try to get some answers on, and we'll continue to do so. There is a level, I'll tell you, there is a level of frustration because a lot of these key issues that you're talking about, whether they're funding with uh, the sequestration problem, whether it's air traffic controllers that look like we're going to have a shortfall with people who are retiring, uh, all the different aspects that are controlled by the FAA. Uh, we have oversight and authorization uh, authority and responsibility, but we really can't dictate. So if we think we have a really good idea that would really work because we've listened to stakeholders and we've got a position that will, again, work from the real world, uh, we don't have the ability to flip a switch or press a button and make it happen. And that is very, very frustrating when we keep running into the bureaucracy and, and certain times, in, uh, and maybe their hands are tied by OMB. Uh, maybe, maybe FAA would like to do some things uh, and they just can't get the green light because uh, somebody at a different level is looking over their shoulder. Uh, but these are the things that make a difference. These are the things that really are going to affect the world that that you work in and live in and, and fly in each and every day. Uh, they're going to keep being top priorities, and I can promise you that uh, I will work very hard to keep the lines of communication open with Lee and ALPA and the other various stakeholders, and we'll be available to meet and to listen on very short notice on any wide variety of topics. But your input is very important, and I once again thank you for the opportunity to be here today.